think the, I really keep looking back at Uber as like this turning point for uh, uh, a lot of folks saying openly that the emperor has no clothes in a lot of these companies. So, so for a very long time, uh, you know, investment, you know, funds, these, these larger firms were willing to go along with the idea that we can just sort of burn money and, and chase wild, rapid growth for, for, uh, for for a while and and be okay with it and and now you know Uber the Uber IPO kind of marked this point where oh maybe maybe we're not as willing to deal with losses like this as as uh, as we were for for years before maybe we start wanting to actually see profitability and now we're going to start looking at uh, fund managers uh, looking backwards and saying you know maybe doing a version of history that might be a little stronger than is actually real you know like how how loud were the voices in the room saying you know we shouldn't be chasing this this growth. So I don't know. I mean, everyone kind of likes to look in retrospect and say, hey, I was the, the voice of reason here. But um, but I'm it's funny to see them kind of coming out sw swinging right now. Yeah, well, I want to get your thoughts on this, too, because I mean, you would think with a managed fund like T. Rowe that they'd be doing their due diligence and maybe it wouldn't have gotten to this point, And yet here we are. Absolutely right. I mean, that's why people put their money in the managed funds as they expect. The managers can get up really early in the morning, do the due diligence, and do the worrying so that it can be safe. I want to congratulate, by the way, Mike on his reporting. He's done a spectacular job on this. But I was very oh, disappointed you. in the managers of T. Rowe Price saying things like, oh, it wasn't our fault. You know, they wouldn't let us out of the last part of the investment. Or we kept trying to tell them things and they wouldn't listen. Well, if you've got yourself into a situation where your people aren't listening to you and you've locked yourself in so you can't get out of the investment without their permission, that's your fault. So I don't want managed funds that manage my money that way. So you think it's just, Walter, another black eye for, for active and managed funds, basically, and, and will keep people flowing into index funds and ETFs? Well, you have to figure out why are people flowing into index funds. I think it's things like this. Now, I also think one of the situations here, and Mike can comment on it, is that sometimes you have companies, and I know this having written about Apple in the early years with a Steve Jobs, where it's truly mm -hmm. driven by a passionate founder, and sometimes that works really well. And sometimes, as with Apple, it's got to go through a cycle. And then it works really well when Steve Jobs comes back. But whether it's Travis Kralinick, you know, or Adam Newman or what others, you must have some restraints when there's this type of founder burning through money. Yeah. Um, Mike, I mean, certainly SoftBank has been under increased scrutiny as of late. But overall, when you look at the private market and, and the way funding is continuing and valuations there versus what we've seen playing out uh, in yeah. the public markets, I mean, I just think about a recent IPO, Casper, last week, uh, that ultimately it's trading another name that is another unicorn in the private market that's trading well below its IPO, IPO price and at more than half the valuation it had in the private market. Um, is this reckoning actually happening right now, is there actually, I guess, a move between these two different marketplaces to, um, I guess, come to come to reality with each other? Yeah, totally. No, I mean, so look, I um, just speaking to, you know, Steve, uh, the Steve Jobs sort of phenomenon. I mean, Walter knows this better than anyone. You know, I think a lot of investors, a lot of funds out there want to find that next Steve Jobs, especially in his passing. And and part of the investment thesis is really finding those those founders that have that level of passion, that level of drive to take companies to the next level and, and really seeing visionaries where other 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 investors might not see them. And and perhaps, uh, uh, you know, perhaps there was probably a little more willingness to see that in, in folks like like Adam Newman and, and maybe Travis, you know, the jury's sort of still out on him. But uh, but on these founders that uh, that pushed it too far. And now I think we're seeing that sort of repositioning r right now where, you know, we, we, we haven't necessarily found that next Steve Jobs for each company, and, and the market is kind of coming back down to reality. And, and perhaps now this is this era of, hey, let's, let's try to get to profitability in, in public-facing companies. And, and maybe, maybe uh, in the meantime, maybe when we get back to rationality, that, that next, found, the next like, 
visionary founder will come come uh, come whether we expect it or not. Well, let me ask you, Matt and Nancy, as hey, an can investor. Can I follow up on that real quick? Oh. Okay, go ahead, Walter. Just real quick, I think we ought to make clear that Travis Kralinick yes. and Adam Newman did have a lot of vision. I mean, man, creating yeah. Uber, that's amazing. And in this day and yeah. age, having a co-working space that, cha that deals with the changing workforce and doing it in the way he did, those were great visions. I'm just saying somebody yeah. needed to uh, oversee the cash flow a little bit better.